Hey. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much for having us. Good to today. see you. Thanks for coming today. Yeah, it's good so, to see you Clay, we've met on Zoom. Yep. Uh, Ivy. Ivy. Yes. Glad to have you here, Thank Ivy. Thank you. Yeah, this is so beautiful here, this location. You know, we've been really fortunate. This location has been absolutely ideal. It's close to Silicon Valley. People come down with a short trip, they can get out of the office, and in a half hour, they're down here looking out at this instead of buildings. Well, we're so excited to see the space today. What are we going to see? Well, I'm going to show you everything that we that we uh, have under this roof, which is, you know, a development capability, a clean room manufacture, uh, injection molding, uh, 3D printing, extensive capabilities, uh, uh, mold making. So you're going to wow. see you're going to see everything we have to offer. Um, see how it can fit into your development project that we hope we can uh, facilitate for you. Take my idea to fruition. Let's, That's let's, right. Let's see what you can okay. do. So let's go take a look at the lab first and then we'll continue through the rest. Great. So the, the important thing to, to note here is that uh, I, I emphasize development a lot more than I say uh, a design. There are design firms, there are manufacturing firms, Development encompasses the entire spectrum of taking things from a concept on the whiteboard and all of the iterations that, that you go through in order to uh, make a product become reality. Because frankly, nothing is ever right at first. Most inventors think, I've, ha I've got an idea, I'm, I'm basically done. It's never that easy. It takes a lot of work, even for simple products, to to uh, go from, from gray matter to hardware. And so in this space, we can do a lot of building of prototypes and testing of ideas. So uh, I like to say that we're very Edisonian in our approach. Thomas Edison was brilliant, the most uh, prodigious inventor in our history. The process is to take your best concept, design it up as best you know, build it, test it, learn from the process, and each step along the way, you iterate and it teaches you what to do next. And that's the process of development. So what happens in here? So in this particular space, we uh, develop uh, catheter prototypes, catheters of all sorts. A lot of people laugh when they hear catheter because they only think of a urinary catheter. There are catheters uh, of all uh, sorts to do all sorts of wondrous things in the body. For example, uh, just two years ago, I had stents put in my heart, and this is technology that I helped develop back 20 and 30 years ago, and all they do is they go in through these little holes in the wrist to access the heart to put stents in. We develop products like that. So we, we've built uh, products to go in the brain, in the eyes, uh, through all parts of the body to to uh, perform whatever therapy is needed for a specific procedure. And so we develop uh, all sorts of things here. We, we've actually serviced over 500 clients. And so we've helped develop so many different things. This particular area is catheter technology. Over here we do uh, a variety of other types of technology. Uh, in fact, I, we have something that I can show you. Um, we have permission from our clients, so I'll show you something that we have set up over there in, in the other side of the lab. What do we call this thing? So, so yeah, Jeff, any like special capabilities here? I know you mentioned catheters, but like what sort of equipment have you had to bring in house uh, for these specialty projects? Uh, excellent question. So, um, I, I like to buy machines, by the way. So <laughs> give me any excuse and I'll buy a machine. <laughs> but but uh, uh, it, what's important is to be able to develop things in house. So if we have to go outside to someone that that has a specialty function in their shop, it may cost me two weeks, and waiting two weeks to get something done drives me crazy. And it drives my clients crazy, because two weeks is, is uh, uh, very expensive. In, in fact, your most precious commodity is, is, is time. And so whatever we can do to facilitate quick turn on, on testing and proving out ideas, uh, we do here. So for example, um, I'll just grab an example. <clears throat> this is just an industrial piece of equipment. It's a rolling mill. Yep. Quite often we need to take wire, say stainless steel wire, and we need to make it a different shape. And so we can roll it through this and make 
a round wire, flat, thin, long. We can do all sorts of things. So all over the, the, the shelves here, you'll find all sorts of seemingly bizarre stuff. Because we've accumulated stuff over years and years of doing projects, the important thing there is that when an engineer or a client or a technician has an idea, we want them to be able to go into the lab and try it right now. Because if, if, you, let it, if you let it go too long, they may lose it. So, so what's really critical is to take an idea, go into the lab and test it as quickly as possible to learn the next iteration. Yeah, and I, I mean, speaking of timeline, right? It's you learn immediately, you take those results, and you iterate the next one. There's not the delay of someone else doing it. Or there's not the practicalities of when you're trying it on the machine, you see something that you wouldn't have seen if you outsourced it to somebody else. To have those capabilities here are huge. And I mean, I already feel pressure from our investors to meet the timeline. So when you say, hey, we care more about the timeline than anything else, I, uh, I breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm so refreshed to hear you say that because so often our clients don't have that ex express experience to knowing that the, the quick turnaround, because like I said, quite often uh, people will have an idea, investors have invested and they think because they had an idea and designed something that it's not done yet. That they're ready to go to market. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just doesn't work that way. My idea isn't perfect at the beginning. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> we'll help you make it more perfect. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. So, so let, let me show you uh, how the master craftsmen here, the master technicians might go about building a catheter. And, and they have so much experience. These, these technicians are masters of their craft. They've been building catheters of all sorts for 30 years. And so when the engineers have an idea we want to implement, they're the ones that help us understand the reality of what we can and can't do. And they're, they're the ones that build stuff. And so let me show you uh, in, in closer detail. So here, Tony is building a, a balloon catheter. What's a balloon catheter? Uh, balloons are used a lot in the body to perform various uh, types of therapy. Like I mentioned, I got stents put in my coronaries two years ago, which are deployed uh, on a balloon, on a catheter. They go in with a, with a very small catheter, maybe, maybe a, a millimeter and a half in diameter, and, which is a sixteenth of an inch, and they go through a little tiny poke in my wrist in the radial artery, get it into my coronaries, inflate a balloon, which places a stent, and then by deflating the balloon, they can leave the stent in that, place. Like yeah. this right here is a balloon? On and this is a balloon wow. on a catheter, wow. and he can inflate and deflate that balloon to perform whatever therapy this product is intended for. And so every catheter is made specific to a procedure, which then gets clearance through the FDA to perform that procedure. So obviously, this is R&D, Kind of space right here right this is not going in human this is not going probably an animal um could you build this same catheter once you refine it here and actually build this catheter here to go into human excellent question so the process would be that here we would we would prove ideas yep. uh test them in, in on a bench model for example uh in a, in a in a way to see that this can deploy in the vasculature maybe we we model it in uh, in uh, uh, polymeric tubing, yeah. for example. I see math in the tubing. Is that <laughs> tubing is that galore. Tubing galore. Yeah, it required over the years to, to actually prototype and test. Exactly. And, and then once we have something that is performing adequately, then we have to go through all the rigors of, of testing, documentation, so that what we are then going to go into the clinic to use is done properly following all the, the requirements of uh, standards and uh, the regulatory agencies, such as ISO standards and the FDA requirements and so on. Mm -hmm. And so yes, to, to answer your question, this would be to, to iterate ideas. Sure. When we have the ideas that we ultimately want to use, we would and then take them into our manufacturing space to build the final product that will get used. And you could actually do that in-house. You could take, I mean, obviously you, you described what it takes to get to the you know clinical version but you can actually manufacture the clinical version in-house here exactly wow. and that's why I, i'm glad you asked that question because the important thing about what you're going to see through all this is that we take everything from concept through final product sterile able to go into patients clear through the fda and we have it all under this roof so i have a question for you
for you. I'm like antsy to, to start touching this catheter, right? What is what is the relationship with your clients in the sense of, you know, I'm sure you have some clients that, you know, want to just hand it off and some that want to be hand on, uh, hands on. How, how do you balance that and like what sort of, uh, how do your engineers and your facilities work with different types of clients? So we're very versatile. Sometimes a, a, a doctor will come in with an idea. In fact, let me have you look at the whiteboard right behind you here. Sometimes we'll have doctors come in and we'll, and we'll start here, literally. What they want to achieve is get into, say, some aspect of, of the coronary uh, arteries. And here, then we would start sketching out sure. what might achieve what they want to do. And so after we know what we want to build, having brainstormed this, and brainstorming is a very important aspect of all of development, then we start here, we build it, and then we, we test the, the, the reality against the concept. The doctor then could come back in here, test it on the bench, mm -hmm. see if it feels right to him, see if the balloon inflates uh, uh, fast enough for his application, and so on and so forth. And quite often, we have uh, doctors right here working with us elbow to elbow at the workbench, as well as clients. Uh, another way that we work, and perhaps the other end of the spectrum, is a, a, a company who has already developed their product. They already have uh, proven the concept where they want it, and they just want us to manufacture it. They'll come in with a stack of documents and say, build this for us. Mm -hmm. In which case, we then have to um, uh, bring that into uh, our system under the umbrella of our quality systems, because we are ISO certified, so we have ways that we must do things. And so we, we bring in their specifications and we can manufacture that. And everything in between. So do you, with those, do you ever do like second generation stuff where you're adding features from something that's already at market with, with these large suppliers or? Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, so <clears throat> so it, it, it's very common for a product to get launched, go to market, and although engineers always think they're, and, and the doctors always think their ideas are 100% and it, that's it. The reality is when you get it into the hands of hundreds or even thousands of, of actual clinical users, that's when you learn a, a, a lot more of the reality of the clinical environment and that product's use than what you can even conceive in, in this environment. Right. And so usually you're developing your second gen product by, by your second year on the market. You should be working on your next generation. or someone else is going to come along, a competitor, and do it for you and take your market away. So, so yes, we very often are, are working on second gen. Interesting. So let's go over to the other side so you can see a couple other projects. I do have permission, by the way, to show. I want to be real sensitive to confidentiality, but these are projects that we can show. Great. That's great. And what's this here? Oh, um, another thing that we do in-house is anything that requires any custom tooling or machinery, we can build machinery. In fact, I'll show you other examples of stuff that we've designed and built in-house to meet a specific manufacturing need. So this, this was built um, as a manufacturing process machine. So, so the next side of the engineering uh, R&D lab is very much like that, except we aren't doing catheters here. We're doing more mechanical, electromechanical kind of projects. Uh, and again, the, the important thing to, to see is that we have stuff stuff that we've accumulated uh, over, over time. Uh, why is that important? Uh, again, having materials that when an engineer has an idea or a client, uh, you never know when an epiphany is gonna come to mind and you wanna test it. Case in point, uh, we were in a brainstorming session. Uh, a client came back from Europe having performed some clinical work with, with a product that we developed, an ophthalmic implant. Mm. And they said, everything that we developed here at Phoenix uh, worked great, but they had used something from uh, another company and it didn't work, so we need to solve that problem. Hmm. So we were holding a brainstorming session, and uh, in the middle of the brainstorm session, an engineer got up and said, wait a minute, I've got an idea, give me a few minutes. And he came out here and was able to pull hypodermic tubing out of one drawer, nitinol wire off of, out of another drawer, and a uh, Dremel tool, and he built up, and in 15 minutes, he built a prototype, he came back into the meeting and said, like I this? tested it, it works. Like that became the product. That's, That's great. Amazing. So again, the critical thing is there, you gotta have tools to work with 
to facilitate the creativity. For example, yeah, good to see this. So we can we can do electrical development here. We have so much stuff. I mean, I know it looks like a bit of a mess. So so we, we let this be this way, by the way. In fact, I encourage this. Why? I've worked at places that were so neat and so clean that people were afraid to use the lab. I don't ever want anyone to be afraid to try an idea. So things can be a bit Loose. of a mess here. So here's an example for uh, that we've been working on. It's a, uh, I won't tell what it is, but you can't tell by looking at it. But this shows <coughs> the kind of the development of, of uh, so much of how things work. So we have components that we've purchased. We have components that we have 3D printed in-house. We have components that have been molded. And this is, this is a product that is, is not yet on the market, but uh, soon will be. And so we develop uh, you know, the software to, to do a specific function, to drive a motor, which uh, has to perform in a certain way. And, uh, and so the electromechanical work we also do in-house, which is actually pretty rare to see someone who does catheter work and yeah, electromechanical absolutely. and the clinical and so on. I mean, like I said, we've serviced over 500 companies and, and, uh, and because I've been doing med tech for 40 years, uh, at collectively we just have such a broad array of things we've done that uh, one client called me, a potential client called and said, have you ever done such and such? And I said, haven't done that, but frankly, nothing scares us anymore. Right. <laughs> and he said, that's what we've heard about you guys. <laughs> so, so, so Jeff, I mean, it's, I, I love seeing the different um, aspects, like, right, it's like, okay, we're not building our motors because we can find those um, and source those, that's fine. Right. But then it's like, okay, some components are available off the shelf, some are 3D printed, some are molded, um, and you have all of these, again, capabilities in-house. Tell me a little bit about your engineers. I mean, in the sense <coughs> of, okay, yeah, you mentioned you have you know, software capabilities. How many engineers do you have and what are their specialties in, in the range of specialties they have? So we've got, <clears throat> I think I think we're at 27 engineers now, and uh, we we have electrical engineering, we have mechanical engineering, we have uh, actually an environmental engineer hmm. also. Uh, we've had um, uh, biologists on staff. We have biomedical engineers, uh, software. Uh, we we like to have a broad spectrum of talent, uh, and we will take anyone with. Uh, a technical bent, yes. so to speak, and we'll we'll uh, uh, turn them into what we want them to be because we do things a little bit differently here, sure. and and so what we particularly like to have is engineers who uh, like to build stuff. Yeah. So many times we've seen it where you have your theoretical engineers and then you have your hands-on engineers, and when it comes to actual execution and building. Uh, uh, hands-on engineers tend to outperform. They do. Well, of course, through the education process, you, you, ha you have to understand the theory behind, you know, physics and engineering and, and, all, sure. and all those things. But the intuition that allows uh, a, an engineer then to take that, that theory and apply it really comes from other things they've done in life. I always like to ask uh, 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 interviewees, I say, what did you do when you were a kid? And if uh, one guy told me, I, um, I build RC planes. Oh, you mean you buy kits and put, no. I design my own RC planes. I'm trying to build the ultimate RC plane that won't, cra won't break when I crash it. <laughs> That's an innately technical person. Yes. And those are the kind of people we want who just grew up building things because they can then take the theory that they learned in school, marry it with their, their uh, uh, experience growing up building whatever yep. and uh, and and we find those to be the the best creative talents so it sounds like they're not afraid to try things I'm, I'm glad you said that because anyone who's afraid to try something really doesn't fit here you have an idea you get out there and you just build it and things that fail is not a failure you always learn from what you did and and even failures can then teach you the next idea oh I hadn't thought of that but it gives me a new idea. Right. And so building, testing, and, and failing is really important. In fact, I've, I've had a lot of Japanese visitors and I've spoken at Japanese conferences and I try to help them understand that a failure is not bad, you learn from it. And, and they have a saying in Japan, they say, say 
Shippa wa Seiko no Moto. What is that? Failure is the foundation of success. Mm. That's great. And it's true. You build, if it doesn't work, it teaches you what to do next. And, uh, and that's what this space is all about. Try whatever comes to mind. I, I actually encourage engineers to do personal projects too. Oh, really? Because the more they're doing, the more they're thinking, and the more it facilitates creativity. Right. So speaking of creativity, yeah. it looks like you're using a sous vide over there to hold temperature of a water bath. Are yeah, in <laughs> fact, in fact, let's go over it. Now, that's one that um, we won't get too close, but, but we'll describe that while we're over there. I don't think the CDs are confidential. In, in fact, in fact, oh, by the way, like we were, we were talking shit. about <laughs> collaboration. Yeah. So, hey, so, so, so this is Kyle, he's, client, he's an engineer with one of our other clients. Oh, very cool. And I he's here, he's yeah. here a lot, in fact, how, and Oscar, you, you've been, yeah. how, how much have you been here in the last two weeks? Uh, every day. <laughs> so so we're, uh, heavy yeah. collaboration. Very cool. And then um, uh, here we have Ashby who is uh, working with them on this project. And while we won't describe in detail what the product is, you had asked about the, the test apparatus. Mm -hmm. uh, Ashby, can you, can you tell what you have here for a test apparatus? Great. And so you can see that we didn't have to build something extremely elaborate for this. This is, this is basically a, a, a storage tote with heating circulating units in it, whereas some labs would have spent $20,000 building an elaborate tool. We can get the same exact functionality out of, out of stuff that we I can love find that. off the shelf. That's very cool. Yeah, because, you know, clients don't want to spend right. yeah. unnecessarily. And so that, that way of, of, uh, of testing is, is really important awesome. to be able to understand the science, the physics, everything that underlies what needs to be tested and approach it that way rather than. In an than efficient way. In an efficient way, exactly. So one, th one thing I'm trying to impress upon, since you've been here a lot, uh, in fact, this project's been going on for a, like year, a year or half. so. Yeah. So um, I want them to appreciate just how closely we collaborate with clients. Uh, again, let's not go into detail on the product, but sure. if you can tell how it's been working with my engineers, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So we've basically, uh, you know, it started with a, a need for a very specific design feature. It could be designed, we didn't have capacity in house. So we worked with Jeff through references and everything else, and we started weekly meetings, worked with their engineers. We came up with a novel solution to that design feature, and through just naturally what makes sense for the next step, well, since he's, since he's designing and building that feature, let's design and build the assembly. Let's, let's package it here. Let's manufacture it here. And it just grows into the full product. So you guys so, had a full separate company, didn't correct. have the capabilities in-house. Correct through reputation, met Jeff and Phoenix DaVinci's, started to see the capabilities here, and then started moving more things from your you know, your facility in-house here. That's right. Amazing. Yeah. And how many engineers do you guys, are you working with here? We are growing internally with uh -huh. our, at our company. Uh -huh. we, we, but when we started, it was three of us, uh -huh. and now we're getting up to 25. Wow. So it's, it's this past year and a half has been very good and so that the progress that we've made on the design has obviously built confidence with our investors and then that's allowed the team to grow. Congratulations. So, yeah. Thank exciting. You. Sounds yeah. fun. Definitely. And, and there's, I won't tell you about it, but it's an exciting product that's going to, I think, hit the market and go crazy. Hope so. It's going to save so. lives. And that's what this is all about, we're saving lives. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, so let's let's leave the the free thinking area <laughs> and move into the area that, that is a little more constrained. Um, we, we'll, we'll come around the corner here. Now, by the way, all across the front here we have engineering offices. Okay. So, so these cubicles are engineering offices. Uh, these are my directors and uh, uh, Bryant, who is, who is our president, uh, is housed over there. Our COO is out of the office today. Val is our controller. She keeps me under control. <laughs> I see you have the anatomy. Yeah. And are yeah. these oh, oh. as well? I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. So. What, what we did, whiteboards eventually, you know, you can't erase them. So we've converted everything to glass. And so we've got these uh, posters and put them behind glass 
So we can use these for brainstorming. For example, we'll have doctors come in and we'll sit here and talk about anatomy. And uh, you know, if we're talking about a joint, we're, we did a, a you know a, a, a spine surgery procedure that uh, that comes in into uh, this joint right back here, and so we you know we can brainstorm and we can we can draw all over this on what the procedure might be with what the tools might be, and then uh, we can we can actually after we've drawn sketches of what something might be like, I won't draw that product. <laughs> uh, we can take pictures of this, we can sign this and date it and take a picture, it goes in the file oh, cool. as part of the creative right. process. Yeah, so these have been have re been really, really productive to help the, the brainstorm process. And speaking of whiteboards, I mean, we just live by the whiteboards here. I can't, I can't communicate without a whiteboard. So you can see uh, when we have a sketch for a tool or a fixture or a product, you know, we're always, we're always brainstorming ideas uh, on the whiteboards. Now, what you're going to see here now is our production area, <clears throat> part of our production area. We have three clean rooms that we maintain uh, at uh, ISO class uh, seven, which is the same as, as uh, uh, class 10,000 clean room. And we keep them certified. You can see we, we actually post the certifications uh, so that people can see and so that we know uh, how things were last time we did an inspection run and so on. Looks like everyone's at lunch right now. We. Um, so I'm sorry, Jeff. Yeah. My background's medical. I'm not familiar with clean rooms. Can you tell me kind of like what the different levels of clean room actually means and how that's applicable to like the device, whether it's indwelling or it's uh, membrane contact with the skin? Like, what does that actually mean? Uh, excellent question. So. The different levels of, of clean room, like I said, ISO class seven or class 10,000. Okay. The, the 10,000 refers to the number of particulate count per cubic meter right. in the airspace gotcha. of a given size. The given size, if, if I recall correctly, it's in the range of like four microns uh, uh, particle size and 10,000 particles per per cubic meter of airspace, gotcha. which seems like a lot to your question then. This is not clean by electronic standards, okay. uh, where integrated circuits are made yeah. are far, far, far cleaner than this. Okay. But interesting uh, point about this is that uh, products that are made in this clean environment, and this is the standard in the industry, okay. if there is some particulate as fine as what that uh, clean room standard requires, the body actually filters that stuff out. So you can go in with microscopic um, particulate on a product. Of course, everyone, everyone would like to have them absolutely clean, but microscopically, there's stuff you truly you can't see it. it when it's used in the body, the, the body is a wonderful filter and it takes it takes it out of the blood and expels it in, in a natural way. So you have the clean room capabilities to, to go into the body, um, as in into the veins, into the lungs, into the heart, um, obviously once sterilized, post sterilization. So cleanliness as far as microparticles done, but um, sterilization obviously happens. Correct. Post assembly. Good, uh, glad you asked that question. So so uh, you asked about different different functions in the body, for example, Everything we build in here, they're, they're going to be disposable products like a catheter or a dental product we do, we do in here regularly. Uh, they're disposable products that don't end up in the body. Anything that ends up in the body, an implant, has a completely different standard. Mm -hmm. We will manufacture implants. For example, we've done, we've done uh, valves for the heart. Wow. We've done uh, implants that go in the eye. We have done the, we, we performed the final manufacturing steps under a class 100 hood. Now consider that class 10,000 has 10,000 part particles per cubic meter of airspace. Uh, class 100 has 100, that's, that's 100 times cleaner. And that's where we do the final steps of, of that clean it, package it, and so on. So, right. so depending on what the function is in the body, mm -hmm. we'll use different levels of cleanliness. 
And then, so obviously, it sounds like you guys are doing, you said, a mitral valve uh, here, you know, a, a, a artificial heart valve. Correct. That's made here. Is that a class three or a class two device? That's class three. So, okay. so obviously, you're, you're familiar. Um, uh, typical FDA designation of class one, two, and three. A class three is a product with the highest risk to the patient should it fail. Right. A heart, heart valve. valve. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, and so on. Um, uh, we, we've done uh, many class three products. The majority of products in the market and what we do are class two. Uh -huh. We've done some class one, but uh, most of class two and some class three. Now back to the three clean rooms. So, so our, our team is just coming back from lunch now. So here we do the dental product. We've, we've made well over probably a million and a half of these things. Uh, and then uh, we can do catheters in the back of the room. That room over there, we isolate to anything that uses liquid silicone. Mm. Silic that glass on the uh, it's, it's, a, it's a soft wall, it's a, a vinyl material. Okay. Um, and it's cleaner? It's, it, it's not cleaner, we segregate it because of what we do in there. Okay. Silicone, liquid silicone, you do not want to get anywhere else in your manufacturing facility. Okay. So we segregate anything that requires silicone in that room. Okay. Because when silicone gets free, it's like an alien in, uh, invasion. I mean, you, you, it's hard. It's hard to clean up and so on. So we we keep all silicone work segregated to that room. And as you know, what happens in the clean room, uh, you know, you have a, a gowning area where you go sure. in and you 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 don't get out of your street civvy, uh, civilian clothes, but you cover them with a, a clean barrier. You know, something to cover your head, hands your body and your feet. With and the scrub down station before surgery. Uh, ex exactly. Gotcha. And so you'll see the operators in there all gowned up and so on. And that's how we, one of the important aspects of protecting the cleanliness of the room. Because if you were to walk in with your street clothes, you're, you're bringing in pollen right. from outside and stuff on your shoes and so and you so said on. this room is a 10,000. Class 10,000. And is it a different room that where you do the 100? That's elsewhere. Uh, uh, that's elsewhere. elsewhere. In fact, yeah, we'll show that in the next room actually. Okay. So th this is what we call a clean environment, but we don't certify it as a clean room. Mm -hmm. Class eight, so it's not as clean as there, and the products we manufacture in here don't require the level of cleanliness. Okay. So we don't certify it because it's not necessary. But but to your point about the uh, where we do the class 100. Now this is also a class 10,000 room, but if you look in there, you'll see, you'll see a, a smaller hood yeah. with its own HEPA filtration, positive airflow, and that is a class 100 hood. Okay. So uh, operators will work from in, in front of there, putting their hands inside and do the assembly within that in, in a much cleaner environment. Okay. Gotcha. And then you know, how does that work with different projects? Because I mean, it sounds like you have multiple projects going on at a time yeah. at different levels. How do you set up for manufacturing for one schedule. project? Yeah, the schedule, how does that work? Uh, good question. So there, there's a practice that is typical in, in the medical industry. Uh, if you're manufacturing something on a line and you complete a build and then you go to the next product to be built, you have to perform what's called a line clearance. You completely clear from the work environment anything that had to do with the previous job. Uh -huh. Components, materials, documentation, everything. And it's like starting with a blank slate uh -huh. so that then you can start the next build, bringing in now your materials, documentation, and so on for the next build. That line clearance is absolutely critical to what you do, and that's one of the ways that you certify uh, your, <coughs> your ISO system. ISO means International Standards Organization. Our notified body is uh, is BSI, uh, British. I don't know what BSI stands for. Uh, uh, they they come in to audit us uh, annually, make sure we're following our systems, and that's one of the things that they will always check for to see that there's evidence in the documentation that we're performing those functions. So for the line clearance that you talk about, do you have somebody in-house that is responsible for scheduling the different companies that are going to be using, or uh, do they communicate with one another? Uh, we have 
Unfortunately, you won't meet her today. Um, Daisy Coleman is our chief uh, operating officer. Been with me for, I think, eight years now. Yeah, eight years. And worked for me at, an, at a previous company also, uh, 25 years ago. And um, she, she is amazing. Mm -hmm. She has the head f for sh juggling all of the hundreds pieces. of things simultaneously wow. and then and then control through our uh, MRP system uh, uh, I think that's materials resource planning software she schedules everything uh, with the clients uh, so we would be working with her for that type of exactly and weeks and even months in advance okay. uh, she is planning and scheduling production Great. it's a good idea what sort of production are you guys doing there as far as like quantity is it uh, 10 units a month or is it a 10,000 units a month like what, what can you build? obviously depending on the complexity of the product but what's, yeah, what's yeah. your range when a company first starts out quite often uh, if they're only doing a clinical study for example sure. they might need 30 of something yeah. or a hundred or 200 uh, and and any medical product when it gets on the market you know if in their first year on the market they if, if they if they do 10,000 procedures they've done extremely well because it takes a long time for a medical product to penetrate the market, right? But we have a dental product that we 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 do about a hundred thousand copies a year. Wow! And uh, we've done probably a million and a quarter of those. We've been doing it for for quite a while. Wow. And then we have other things that we do. You know, five hundred copies every month, and so wow. on. So yeah, a range. We we span for, a broad from, from ten to ten thousand a month. That's yeah. amazing. Exactly. Wow, what do we have here? So this is this is our 3D printing area. Now 3D printing has almost become ubiquitous in industry now. Um, there's, there's a lot of really great things about 3D printing and there's some challenge with 3D printing. I've been printing for a long time. I was a very early adopter. 25 years ago I bought my first machine. Thing is, you have to keep up with the technology because every six months someone rolls out a new printing technology. But printing has evolved very highly, um, uh, and so I'll show you some pretty cool examples. Yeah. So over here we have uh, plastics printers, okay. and we have uh, three different kinds, styles of printing. Hmm. The original 3D printing that that got some real traction, that that machine over there, the, the, the orange and black machine. That's a process called uh, fused deposition modeling. It starts with like, it's like weed whacker filament material and it extrudes it and lays down a stream, kind of like, like, kind of like a, yeah. kind of like a hot melt glue gun. Yeah. And it lays down a road of plastic until it builds layer upon layer upon layer. Yeah. And that's the process that really got some traction 25 years ago. And what do you actually use these 3D printers for daily? So every time uh, there's an idea, uh, sometimes you build a prototype just from tubing and wire. Right. Available. Right? But uh, there comes a time on almost every design when you need to actually have hardware designed, ready to be assembled into something more complex. And so We'll take the CAD, the Computer Aided Design Models, uh, which is another great development in, in the last 30 years, is the CAD software facilitates the design so that the uh, engineer is taking the idea, modeling what they want a component and an assembly to, to be like. And then we take those files, run them through other software that converts that file to a code these. that these machines can read. And what's that turnaround time from when the machine receives the... Daily. It, Daily. It, it, Within the day. Oh, oh, perfect example. In fact, uh, let me introduce you to one of our engineers. So so Jordan is is our... our we've dubbed her the, the queen of printing. So, uh, <laughs> so here's something, for example, uh, the, the question uh, Ivy just asked is how, how long does it take to do this? So when did you actually get the file to, to, for these parts? Uh, last night. So okay. last night, and we come in this morning, and, and what do we have? Came off 
We have oh, wow. components <laughs> Save you some work. grown in, in, in plastic uh -huh. through a laser light curing the liquid resin which is in there, wow. and, and the, so these cool. machines grow upside down uh, in, in the vertical axis like so, and then you see all this kind of scaffolding. It looks like, looks like a, yeah, a roller coaster. A, a, like yeah, a roller coaster. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then now she'll put it into the washing uh, system. Which is the next uh -huh. one or somewhere else? Uh, that's another okay. machine. These little like a little washing machine, okay. and then break off the support material leaving just the components behind so this is this is one type of printing but like i said you know ultimately so a little history that type of machine was the type that i bought first 25 years ago it cost one hundred and thirty thousand dollars wow that machine cost two thousand dollars right wow. did we buy yeah. and these machines are now hundreds of dollars Amazing. hundreds yep. of dollars yep. from from amazon to print precision like detailed components. So long as you have the software. As long, well, yeah, and the software comes all with it. So I can see this being great for iteration, prototyping. What else would you use 3D printing for? So I mean, obviously this is not gonna be for large scale production. What's another example that like 3D printing is critical for what you guys are doing? Well, well, this is how we prove out our designs. Sure. So every design that we have uh, done the CAD work on, the, the, the computer aided design work on, yep. We grow it to see if it fits together the way we thought. And once it, once we have it looking the way we want, and it fits together the way we want, that would be and and that process to... exactly. So so daily we can turn around iterations. If 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 by the end of the day the engineer assembles this and says uh, I don't like the way this feels or this doesn't assemble right, he can make a small tweak and tomorrow have the next iteration. Uh, say something about. Uh, for manufacturing, like you can build a single assembly for manufacturing. You know, you can, like, that's the main thing. It's like, okay, if I just need something to manufacture, or even like a test kit, like, right, where it's like you only need one off. So it's great for prototyping, but it's also great for okay, manufacturing. Excellent. Yeah, well, manufacturing and, and testing assemblies that you maybe only need to use once or you need one up, but it's a specialty part. Okay, we could also. So, so the beauty of this uh, of printing is that you can test your ideas readily. Um, you can use them for show and tell when you're going to investors. Instead of just saying, imagine if you will, you can hand them hardware. Yeah. And hardware will land an investment much more than waving your arms yeah, and showing them numbers, right? And so, uh, so this is to, to prove out your ideas, to see if, if the aesthetics are what you thought they were gonna be. Because it's one thing to draw on, you know, it's quite another thing to have hardware in hand to see how it looks. Yeah. And then to move towards production is really important because once you have all the components interacting in an assembly the way you want and then the whole assembly as you saw in the lab yeah. sure. completely working then we could take the the designs and make injection molds to make production quantities gotcha which you know we'll get there in a little bit in, on tour because we do that also but printing has become integral and absolutely necessary to today's engineering process so let me show you something else that's just way cool so you get a sense for how this digital technology is so incredible. Here's a, a model of a heart. Hmm. So the engineers uh, took this model from online. You can, you can, you can get uh, 3D scans of, of a heart model. So a real patient's heart. Which came from a, uh, a, a CAT scan. Yep. It's, a, it's a data cloud sure. of all the data points. And then, uh, and then we can take that and through the software, turn it into so you can, you can see the support material, but turn around here so you can see, yeah. see you know the, the the structure of the of the aorta coming over here, yep. the various major vessels, the coronary arteries, and so ah, on. So, so cool. these are the support materials, and this is the actual. Is it like a plastic? Uh, correct. In fact, um, why don't you why don't you touch it? I can't. Oh so, I don't, don't want to get. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. So that's all. Can I see. That's all different, I want to see. different types of plastic. And this, this one is a pliable plastic. Okay. Not quite like rubber, but Soft. softer. And what are they going to use this for? I don't know. What are you using <laughs> this one for? Oh, amazing. Uh, for testing of the catheters. Okay. So you're actually going to stick catheter through there. The are the coronary arteries actually hollow? The Ho whole heart is hollow. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so all of these are. Uh -huh. Yeah. Very cool. Cool stuff, huh? Yeah. 
Awesome. Don't you want to go be an engineer now? I know, I know. <laughs> so, oh, oh, um, good timing. Okay. I want to introduce you to some visitors. They're out here looking to see if uh, we can do work for them. This is Clay and Ivy. Hi, nice to meet you. Frank, nice to meet you. Clay, nice to meet you. Ivy, nice to meet you. Ivy, nice to meet you. So just so you understand our organization, Bryant is, is our president and chief product officer. Uh -huh. I'm CEO and chairman. Um, so uh, I've, uh, he's been with us 10 months now and I'm in the process of handing more and more responsibility to him. Um, so we've been through everything through R&D so far and describing the clean rooms and uh, uh, we walked in and I went, whoa, what's this stuff? And so we're going through the printing area now. Okay. Um, in fact, Have you asking about that? The we, we, haven't, we haven't done the fuse yet. You want to go describe sure. that one? Yeah. So, so this is the fuse. We got this printer about a year ago, and it became quickly our favorite uh, favorite tool. Um, it's a powder printer. It prints nylon 12, and so this is one of the one of the, one of the pieces here. Yep. Just like any 3D printer, it helps us iterate really fast. But is this also plastic? It's also plastic. Yep. It's nylon. Yeah. I don't see any supports. That's exactly the thing that we love about this is it's. it's powder base and so you pack up this box about like that and you don't need any support material you can put it in any orientation and you can put an entire device even to the extent of if you wanted to build say a transmission that has all its gears and everything functioning but you close it off you can do that wow. you can't service it but you can actually design and print something like that as long as you can get the powder out you can so you just have to be able to blow the powder out you have to blow the powder out interesting yep. Uh, it's a two-step process. We're doing the print. Uh, we run it overnight, starting usually about three o'clock. So this is finishing up from, from last night. Sometimes we'll do a longer build, uh, and so this will run overnight. And we'll put in three or four different projects. And because we don't have to do support material, we can pack it in super tight, so it's really efficient. Mm -hmm. And then we bring it over to the processing station, and um, the parts will go in here. They get ejected up and out. And, oh, really? Yeah, and usually an engineer will go through and clean up the parts a little bit, blow them off, and it actually allows us to reuse the powder, so we don't have to throw it away. So it's a very efficient system. So we just finished off uh, a new batch of powder there, so it's mixing that up, getting ready to reload for tonight. Very cool. Oh, wow. And I heard you say that you'll do multiple uh, products yeah. on one print. Yeah. So for, I'm sure there's like a setup fee or something, you know, it's time consuming, so you can spread that out amongst your clients. Correct. So we so we right? charge on a time to build process plus setup. Okay. In fact, you can see, if, if you want to look closely on the screen, you can see how all the components oh, okay. are organized in such a way that the chamber can build vertically. You see the blue yeah, plane is. is growing like this, showing where they are in the build. That's really cool. So th th this has become our favorite machine because it is it is so productive, and because it's building in nylon, the parts yeah. are tough, durable. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So that's a very different process than the resin printers that we have over there, and each one of them has their pluses and minuses. Sure. Okay. So, have you had a chance to look at the resin printers? Yeah, we were looking over there. Great. Yeah. It's amazing how the technology has evolved. How how the the orange printers uh, for five, six thousand dollars, that technology is now at the, the six hundred dollar class. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So in, in order to make some of the high performing catheters today, okay. uh, this process is really fascinating. It's called braiding. Okay. Just What's like just like doing a French braid on your hair, yeah, but in I need this, this case, for my daughter. Is it wires? Uh, these, these are these are wires. Okay. Uh, stainless steel wire that's braiding, just like doing a French braid in your hair, but there's 16 okay. carriers. And so it, 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 the, the carriers are weaving in and out and in and out, creating a braid onto, onto a shaft, okay. which then turns into a catheter shaft. Okay. Gotcha. Now, why is that important? Mechanically speaking, the catheter has to have all sorts of um, properties depending on where they're going in the body for example it has to be stiff to be able to push it we call it pushability yeah. very technical Brilliant. term yeah. so the ability of a catheter to be to be pushed but then sure. it has to be flexible yeah. to turn the corners and get into parts of the body for example the coronaries those were very tortuous path to go up yeah. over the aortic arch and into the coronary arteries to perform a therapy very it's different. even more so in the brain where the where the 
vasculature of the brain is extremely complex and tortuous, and sticking something in the brain is, requires a much finer device. Yeah. And so we braid and put different properties, different mm -hmm. mechanical properties at different positions on a shaft by changing the way it, it, they're braided. Interesting. Um, and so, uh, but this, this process is pretty fascinating. Tony, Tony is, again, he's, he's one of our yeah, master our craftsmen. Master, he's, yes. He yeah. can braid, he can braid anything. All right. And so. I have an eight year old daughter that, that needs your attention. <laughs> so this whole machine is just for the braiding? This is yeah. just for the braiding. And what you see come out of this, do we have a braided shaft here that we can show? Sorry, Jeff, while we're waiting on him. Did you purchase the equipment for a specific client, or is this something we, you, we did. you didn't? Right? Well, and now you use it for everyone. We need this generally, but we did buy it for one product, okay. and that's where things usually go. If if a product needs a specific technology, mm -hmm. I'll acquire it, bring it in, yep. and, and then you know you'll and, use it later. And then we have it. Correct. Interesting. So, there's the so so what does what does all this mean? So here we have a catheter shaft. It's not a it's not a complete catheter yet but uh, it's a sub-assembly. So this is very flexible, but, but it's stiff so that I can push it, yeah. but I can also torque it, meaning I can turn this thing, oh, wow. and it will turn really? up here by turning the back end in what we call a one-to-one -one ratio. It, it has wow. very high degree of controllability, and in this case, Tony, Tony, why don't you pull, pull the wires? Tony built into this the ability of this catheter to to be steered through the body so by by deflecting the end, and we're just doing that by by hand now. Yeah. Instead of there's not a controller on the sure, end. but if you had a controller, if we had a controller, then absolutely. But by being able to deflect this, we can steer it mm -hmm. to whatever part of the body it needs to get into to to. Uh, produce a therapeutic effect. Is this braiding always the same, or can you actually program the braid uh, to get different? Excellent question. It, it, yes, we program different density of the braid right. in order to get different effects. Sometimes sure. we want a stiffer shaft. Sometimes we want a, 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 a somewhere along the catheter wants to go from stiff to and soft. You can change it. We can change wow. it along. The, Sure. Along the shaft, so you could have pushability for you know the ninety percent of it, and then steerability for that last ten percent. Correct. Okay. Is he inputting a software to this? To uh, correct. So, so, so the controller here allows him to put in all the parameters that allows him to make a catheter shaft with whatever mechanical properties are required. Yeah. So, so the next step in making catheter shafts, like you just saw, right. is after we have the braid braided onto a shaft. Uh, with a uh, uh, what's called a liner. There's a there's an inner uh, polymer liner, a thin plastic tube. Uh -huh. It comes over here, and we do uh, lamination. Now, this can either be done in in an oven, but we get much better control with this kind of a heat process. So you see you see the catheter shaft on a mandrel. Okay. The heat cycle. This thing travels down. Uh, uh, is this traveling now, Tony? Yeah, yeah. So it's actually, oh, yeah. yeah, here we go. So here's here's the motor position and the temperature wow. on, w oh so, goodness, so this has four stations and this is moving and, and shrinking because we put it, then a heat shrink layer over this and this machine is shrinking the layer onto it. Okay. So this is how catheter shafts are made around the world. So just, what's, sorry, I, I just noticed something. When uh, we were talking to, I believe it was Ryan, yeah, he, one of the three parts was actually that part. So this is this is a machine that you guys built. This is not this is not something you purchased. This is something you built. Oh, good point. Yes, we designed to build these machines. Oh, and you wow. see, we've got three of these things. That's insane. So so yeah. this is a custom machine that we built in house. Wow. And to the point of the three D printing, where does that come in handy? Well, yeah, that's, that's a very complex part, and we grow them here. R Ryan actually showed it to us when you weren't there. Cool. Exactly what it does. How it had the fair. gas flow, the heater, and he said, "Oh, it was for making catheters." I just happened to recognize it. Yeah. So this is a the specialty, specialty that, device. That yeah. Open. So again, the idea of keeping everything in house. Yeah. The, the fact that we do it all here is what we're about. Very cool. Awesome. So we, I know we do need to move along, but thank you, Tony, for yeah, for showing us this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So another thing that we do here, for example, in this space, we do a, a variety of things. So this is a, a general purpose area, obviously the catheter shafts, but we also do uh, electronic manufacture here. This is a product that we make, um, uh, you know, 500 to 1,000 copies a month uh, wow. for a, it's a, uh, a blood monitoring system. Um, so we do this here as well. Sometimes this space is used for assembly, sometimes it's packaging. Right now you can see their packaging product to ship out. Yeah. And because it's a, a, a large open space, we can reconfigure the, the space however we do. I like things to be uh, mobile and flexible so yeah. we can change things around whenever necessary. Similar to your opinions, it looks modular in there. We can bring one project and then go to the next. Yeah. This has the same feel. I mean, we, we're, we're, we're servicing a lot of different clients and so we often need to to be uh, uh, rearranging and, and moving things around. Interesting. Uh, let, let's go on to injection molding. The typical process back, you know, 20, 25 years ago, it could take four months, five months to get an injection mold made. Wow. Because they're very, very complex. Uh, and then you get, you get it in and realize, oh no, we didn't include this design feature. So, so I've always been working at ways to, to uh, uh, do rapid molding. And, um, uh, and so part of that is having molding in-house. So we've, from day one, I've had molding in-house. So now we have a dozen machines in here and two machines we use just for, for engineering purpose. But uh, we'll do a lot of low quantity work. As you see, Tony is, hey Tony. Say hi to my visitors. Hi, <laughs> so, so Tony now is molding apart. It's a, it, this in this case, it's a hand operation. Okay. It's often the case that when a product is first introduced to market, their quantities don't justify the cost of an automated tool. So we'll make a mold that we can we can uh, pull core pins and so on uh, by hand. Sure. And yes, the components are expensive but the mold to automate that process could be a $150,000 mold. Sure. But, yep. the, but the way we make a mold like this, maybe it was a $25,000 mold, and it gets them into production. Sure, improves the market, you can improve the market, and you can you know you can reduce cost of automation. Exactly, so sense. we do a Much lot of this kind problem. of hand, hand work. So the machines we have, for example, we have machines ranging from these small guys, these are 12 ton machines, okay. to 110 ton. Now what does that mean? Yeah. Without exactly. getting into to what that means to a machine, it means we're going to do parts that are as small as, okay. like okay. pop rocks. You know, okay. remember oh, remember yeah, the candy small. <laughs> as yeah, small as yeah. that. Two parts that are about like eight inch square, right. okay. depending on the type of plastic that's used. Sure. And all these machines have different characteristics, which make them ideal for shooting smaller or larger parts or different types of plastics and so on. So what have you seen as far as you know, how it feels like there's accountability between your engineers and in the manufacturing? There's a direct line of communication. Um, does that you see that speeds things up, increases the uh, actual uh, quality of the product? Excellent question. And in fact, I hadn't even thought about about that when you say accountability. So when we when we build a mold uh, and then shoot the parts here. The engineer is right on site. Quite often we actually have clients here on the first day that we shoot their parts because they want to test the parts and see if their design even fits together. Yeah. And so, so uh, there have been times when we have actually, you know, fit parts together and find, oh no, this doesn't fit quite right. We need, we need this to be tighter by five thousandths of an inch or whatever. We can take the tool right into the shop, make a modification to the tool, and come and shoot it again the same day. So engineer, client, and manufacturer can all be in the same set at the same yeah. time. Yep. Yeah. Now things don't often don't always work that ideally, but sure. that's the possibility, and we have done that. Um, we also have pad printing in house, um, which is you know in, in the back of the space here, so we can print. We can print uh, identification on. In fact, let's, let's let's walk over this way, so I'll show you that. So so on these parts, you, you see uh, some some text, some font. Uh, it says flex specifically. So we pad printed that on these components. You take ink and you transfer it, the, the image from a plate to this. And that's how, whenever you see plastic, 
you're going to be spoiled now. Every time you ever see plastic parts, you're going to be looking at certain features because now you see how these things are, are, are made. And it looks like it's actually printed on a, a curved material. So it's not just a flat print. You can actually print on curved material. Is that what I'm saying? You've got good eyes. Yes, this is printed on a curved surface. And, and that's the cool thing about the way pad printing works. It's a silicone pad that transfers the ink onto whatever surface, and it can conform to the surfaces. Interesting. We do a lot of over molding also, by the way. Um, uh, now, I can't show you in detail on that. <laughs> so, but I'll just describe. Over molding is molding plastic onto something else. Sometimes it's a hypodermic tube, sometimes it's a, 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 a stainless steel shaft, sometimes it's another plastic tube, right. so that uh, we take a component, put it in the machine, the mold closes on it, it shoots plastic around it, so when we take it out of the mold, it's got plastic molded onto whatever that original component is. Most molders don't like to do over molding. Um, we like to accommodate our customers, so we, we do. And that's all in-house. That's all in-house, right here. Very cool. So let's, let's go through to... Um, More toys. More toys. Oh, I should say that materials. Uh, um, people often ask, what plastics can you do? But we shoot all of the, the common engineering plastics, uh, everything from uh, elastomers, which are very soft, pliable, um, to much more rigid, high, strength material like Ultem, polycarbonate, and so on. Uh, polyolefins, which are polyethylene, polypropylene. I mean, we, we really span the entire spectrum. So if your product is going to require some rigid components, some soft components, we, we do it all. We've got to cover it. Yeah. So let's go into the machine shop. So we, we make molds in several different levels. We found it's more efficient for us to focus our mold making capability, which I'll show you in a little bit, on the engineering cycle. And then when it gets to the point where we are building some quantity of product, we'll send out because uh, we, we have good shops in Taiwan that we, that we use for production molds okay. because they consume a huge amount of resource to build uh, production tools. So if you look at, at uh, molds like this, for example, um, these are very complex. And I'll show you one mold that's, that's pulled open in the shop. But but each each time you're making a mold, it's like it's like a custom V8 engine. Wow. Very complex. A lot of work goes into this. And so we send production mold like this to outside sources so that I can preserve my internal resources for building engineering and prototype molds. Okay. And I'll show you what I mean by that okay. in, in a bit. So I mentioned the oh, wow. complexity of a mold. This mold is is uh, wow. very involved. Uh, it 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 makes two shots at a time, two parts at a time, and okay. it's basically shaped like a like a gun, right. um, a a plastic instrument that's used in surgery. Right. This is what it takes to make those components in production. Wow. And this thing, when it's all assembled, this is only half the mold. This mold weighs like 2,500 pounds. Oh wow. And so those machines have to be able to cycle this thing, take plastic, uh, uh, melt it, squirt it under extreme high pressure into the mold. Is that a pin? That's a core pin from inside the handle. I, yeah, this guy right here. Yeah, this guy here. The, okay. these, are, these are pins that, that slide into the mold and then plastic is, is molded around those pins Pins are then uh, extracted uh, hydraulically, leaving the parts free to then come out of the mold. And I'm sorry, Jeff, you guys built this mold here, or is this? This one we had done in, in, Taiwan. in Taiwan. Taiwan, just the labor, and you know, it's kind of designed to here, tested prototype here, and then for large scale manufacturing, for hours spent, sent it to Taiwan. Correct. And then they it, send it back here. We can, we can do all this stuff, yeah, but, but why would you pay for, for that? For me to use, my correct more expensive resources here yep. and limited resources it would take my shop a month to build this or more yeah. but if i go to taiwan yes they're going to take a, month. A, a while to build it <laughs> yeah. 
but because we've already done the prototyping and so on, I can then put my team back on doing the next project while this, because there, there's got to be a half million mold makers in Taiwan. Yeah, we're paying for your brains and then, and then not your brawn. And we're well, using the, the brawn where it's cheaper. But what's the delay been? I know there's been a lot of delay with resources that are overseas. Have you seen that? You know, for, for the mold making, there haven't been uh, significant delays. What we do see delays in is uh, plastic raw material and things like that are, are delayed significantly. Yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been kind of painful. But you know, to get this mold made, this this mold probably took three months to get it here from Taiwan. Wow. But like I said, it's like what building a do? custom V8 yeah. engine. You know, I've been doing this for a long time, and and I was always keen on on cutting that lead time to get molds made sooner. So everywhere I've been, I had injection molding. And, because I've been in the startup industry. I've, I've been with several startups prior to starting this 20 years ago. And I'm always looking a way to get a mold faster. Mm. So what we've been doing, and others are doing this also. I didn't originate this, but I was very early on in doing Last this. Follower. But making, making a mold like this that we 3D print in plastic allows us to shoot, you know, 20 or 50 or 100 parts Perfect. and then throw the mold away. And, and that is a mold that can be grown, 3D printed, overnight. And, sorry, so how much would, if I just wanted to print a mold so I could get materials that we couldn't 3D print in, how much would that cost to print that mold? In, in plastic? You know, all. we yeah. typically, because it includes the engineering cycle sure. as well, but typically like uh, $2,500. Wow. And you've got parts. Parts next day. <laughs> What's yeah. going on over here? I'm curious. <laughs> so that's, um, the green liquid. Good, I'm glad you asked that. We'll get there in just a minute. Good, you're, that, that, good, good you noticed. Yeah. So, this process has limitations on what materials you can do and the complexity of a component. Because these, these molds don't hold up. They, yeah. they shatter plastic. and they're plastic. But we can print in metal. So for example, this is a printed mold insert. And I'll show you an example of, of what I mean by mold insert in a minute. So this was printed, this was printed, uh, this is printed, and we can print inserts in metal as well as the plastic depending on the requirement. So here's a component that we that we uh, have been, we've actually had the, this product in manufacture for I think 13 years. Wow. And we prototyped with an insert like this when it got into, into production, we printed this. Here's another printed mold. But then with different levels of tooling, depending on your budget and your timing and the, and the technical demands of the mold, we've got five different ways to make a mold. Um, <laughs> funny story, here's a strain relief. I did for a company they back in the garage days. An engineer called and said, Jeff, I need I need a mold for a strain relief. And uh, so I said, I'll have that for you next Wednesday. So it was a sim it, relatively simple mold. I shot him parts in five different materials so we could test how the material worked. Sure. Three months later, purchasing department called and said, Jeff, I need a lot of parts. I said, how many is a lot? 750. Oh, nothing. We'll have those for you next week. So I mold those back in the garage days. <laughs> And then they called and said, I need 15,000 parts. So this is all pulling by hand. Wow. I'm in the middle of a 15,000 part run. And she said, I need 100,000 parts now. So I said, wait a minute, time out. Yeah. <laughs> you got me. I, I'm going to make you a new mold on my nickel. I made him a four cavity mold, but still hand operated. Okay. And we, we pulled 115,000 parts by hand out of, wow. out of the garage. We outgrew the garage, and that's why we're now in 40,000 feet with, uh, with what, what do we have? We have 60 people total and so on. But anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. I haven't forgotten. Okay. But that insert turned into, turned into this mold, okay. which is an eight cavity mold. Yeah. So every shot coming out of the molding press, we get eight components yep. every like 20 seconds. Wow. So this is one that we've done probably two and a half million parts out of this mold. Wow. 
And so now it's out for getting service. You know, periodically you have to service it just like your car, you take it in for servicing, right? So we pull it out and then uh, uh, service the mold when necessary. And uh, and so that's 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 the process. And here's here's uh, the core that was pulled out of this that they're servicing. Okay. So that's the internal configuration of the, of the part. This is the external configuration of the part made in reverse. So when you put it together, oh, and look, there's the part oh, that comes out of it. Okay. Two and a half million of them. Do you, yeah. do you shake when you pick this up after hand pulling 115,000? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a time to do hand pulls, there's a time not to do hand pulls. Sure. Yeah. So the process for making molds, we, we can grow molds, we can also manufacture them in the traditional sense. We've got CNC machines, CNC is computer numerical control. We can take the, the part as designed, uh, the mold makers actually design the mold. So they do it from soup to nuts. They design the mold and build the mold. So back to the accountability. Mm -hmm. They are accountable for making their molds that work. Sure. And then the engineer right there with them. So, so uh, they will design the mold, machine the components that go into making this mold. And, um, and, and part of that process requires this machine. <laughs> So oh, yeah. this is called an EDM machine. That's electrical discharge machine. Oh, you, you can okay. just just don't inhale this. Yeah. So, so this is what's called, like I said, electrical discharge machining (EDM). The way this works is sometimes there are shapes that you can't cut in a traditional machining operation. So what we do is we then machine an electrode. The electrodes are sometimes made in graphite and sometimes in copper and will make the reverse of the shape for the mold and then this burns with a high frequency discharge. It's like zillions of lightning bolts eroding the metal out of the mold to create a feature in a mold that we can't cut. And so you actually hear that thing, and you see the you see the sparking taking place, yeah. and those are the zillions of little lightning bolts. Huh. Every one of those is creating a particle of eroded metal, which is then just flushing out with the fluid. Okay. And so the the end result uh, is is a shape that we just couldn't couldn't have manufactured through through other processes. And why would why wouldn't you just 3D print that? Um, some things are best suited to 3D printing. For example, Ryan showed you the Sodic machine. That can also machine. I used to have two of this type of machine. I got rid of one because of that. Because that particularly is good with features that are deep and narrow, which we would have had to burn. And so having that machine allowed me to sell my other EDM machine. Gotcha. So again, so printed. You know what's best. Yeah, every every tool used in its proper place um, yeah. facilitates so getting so many right, different things. The right done. tool for the right job. Yeah. yeah, and like I said, give me an excuse to buy a machine, I'll take it. <laughs> so again, this is this is really a critical space, and 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 so so all of our tool makers we've actually trained up in house uh, because traditional mold making has kind of gone away. Uh, before the days of CNC, mold making was the, the ultimate machining skill. Frankly, I think it still is, but it's different than other machining skills. So these guys all grew up using computers, right? And so I can take a young guy who's mechanic, me mechanically inclined, who grew up with a computer, train them to be a mold maker easier than I can take an old school mold maker and train them to use computers. So you mentioned before you have 27 engineers. 27 in, engineers. In um, uh, and a to makers, total of 60 employees. 60 employees. And then how, so you have machinists, obviously, in mm -hmm. here. Uh, how, yeah, how is that distributed? I saw, obviously, manufacturing. How, that so work? we got 27 engineers. Our production crew is, uh, in, including a materials management, is uh, about 15 people. And then we've got the, the quality group, which is, um, Three in uh, total of five in quality control, okay. and then the shop is uh, four people full time, 
um, and then the management staff. Gotcha. And uh, the management staff, you know, I'm an engineer by education. I also went to business school, but, but uh, and Brian, who you met, is a physicist by education who moved into engineering uh, halfway through his, his career and so on. Um, Daisy came from materials management and is now the, the COO, uh, chief operating officer, which allows her to then manage all of the ongoing operations of, of taking things from R&D and producing sure. thousands or millions of, of products. And then uh, my director of quality, who you haven't met, has been in quality control for you know, 20 odd years, and, uh, and he's a total ace. I mean, he's a, he, he was a lucky find for us. Um, we aren't gonna make it back over that building in your time constraints, next time. so, so next, ne time. next time you'll meet him. When your project gets up and going, certainly he'll be integral to your project. So one thing, speaking of collaborative mentality, this area right here with this, this is our smaller conference room, but this conference room and these cubicles we make available for clients to come and use oh, when great. they need to come and park for a while. Okay. So if they're here for a week, yeah. you know, they've got a place to work in the conference room to use and so on. So oh, that's great. that works out really conveniently. Okay. So that that is pretty much it. Um, any other questions come to mind that well, I haven't answered? Client of, uh, what type of relationships do you have in the industry that we can benefit from? Mm. Excellent question. Uh, business is about relationships. You know, and, and one thing that's really critical to us is our reputation and the relationships we have with our clients. We have never actively marketed or had a sales effort wow. going on. All of our growth has been, been organic through word of mouth referrals. And, um, and so that, those relationships is what allows that to happen. So when a client comes in and we work with them, what invariably happens, someone comes in and says, I only need to do you know, some small thing. And then when they come in and see everything that we do, and then they see how we operate, within a matter of a couple months, they have a lot more to bring in. So That's what Kyle said. You know, we met Kyle doing oh, the good point. That's exactly what he said. I came in for one small task, and then it's <laughs> grown up, and now we're moving all of our resources over here. That came so. in looking for designed and to manufacture just one little company. So, so those relationships are critical to everything we do, and so we, we really uh, try to go out of our way to make sure that clients are happy and they recognize that those relationships uh, work and that our connections in industry are going to facilitate their success, because as we say, their success is our success. Um, on, on a rare occasion, we find that a client really isn't a fit uh, sometimes it's because the technology isn't a fit for us, but uh, sometimes um, uh, on rare occasion uh, there's some uh, a client that uh, personality just isn't a fit. And in 20 years, you know, we've had I think eight occasions when when that happened, when the personality just didn't jive, and so it didn't work out. Out of how many though? Out of 500 clients yeah. we serve. So, so uh, we we try to have that not happen, but sometimes it does. But uh, that's an excellent question. The relationship is everything. And you Correct. Actually, we're committing to those leases even as we speak. Okay. And then for here, I love seeing all the apartments as a client. There's a comfort that comes in seeing the collaboration that can happen between the clients and the apartments. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, your vision for this space, uh, is there another department that you would want to add to support <clears throat> quality collaboration? What's your vision for this you know, every year I evaluate in my mind whether I want to bring tubing manufacturing in-house, you know, extrusion capability. Uh, we've got good relationships with some extrusion houses outside, so we get good, good results and good turnaround on tubing. But having extrusion in-house could facilitate the development effort you know, all the more. So that's something I, I toy with every year as I'm doing my taxes. Sure. <laughs> So, I mean, we, we've seen it, that, you know, as far as like all of the capabilities that you have. And uh, I said it's like the, the continuation of quality between R&D and development and then to manufacturing and obviously building. Um, but like outsourcing, I mean, obviously you can't be a jack of all trades. You mentioned quality. Do you think like how do you leverage the like Silicon Valley for outsourcing things that you don't have the technical capabilities here, right? You, you, you don't want to be able to do it all. It's relatively rare that we job anything out. Really? 
Yeah, because I, I like doing new stuff. Right. And so, you know, we developed uh, electro polishing in house uh, at a prototype level. We developed uh, chem etching in house, you know, again, at a small level. But when we have to ramp it up, I go outside because I, I can't do everything. As much as I want to claim to, I, I just can't. Uh, so when things exceed our capacity, we'll go out. Or if there is a specific technology that I just don't have, then I'll go out. And of course, Silicon Valley is you know, the tech center for the world, right? But uh, you know, we'll we'll uh, 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 go out when we when we must, but we try not to. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. Well, it's great to meet you. Thanks for coming by. I I love to show off our our. That's a pleasure. We we call it a toolbox. Sometimes toy box. It's I could see I could definitely see both. Yeah, but and it's I, all I, the infrastructure that you'd ever want without having to create it yourself. Yeah, and I love what we do, and we love servicing customers with clever products. So very impressive. We we can uh, continue working with you. Great, yeah, thanks for coming. Pleasure.